Hello there and welcome to Caterpillar Inc. Stock Analysis. Before we start, I want to mention that this video is not a financial advice and it is for entertainment purposes only. This analysis contains two parts, a company overview and evaluation. The purpose of the company overview is to build a background information about the company, like what they do, what industry are they in, and what any other information that we could use it later in the evaluation. And to do that, I went over the last annual report, the 10K report, that the company filed the SEC and it is 207 pages. The second part of this analysis is the stock and trends evaluation by using the discounted cash flow method. Caterpillar Inc. is an industrial company and a leading U.S. exporter. It is one of the largest construction equipment manufacturers. And according to the Fortune.com website, it is one of the 500 Fortune companies and it ranks 73. The company was organized in California in 1925 as Caterpillar Tractor Co. Then it was reorganized in Delaware in 1986 as Caterpillar Inc. The stock symbol is CAT or CAT and is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, France and Switzerland stock exchanges. The outstanding shares on December 31st of 2021 were 535 million shares while one year earlier, it was about 545 million shares, which means that the company bought back about 9.5 million shares and decreased the outstanding shares by 1.7%. In general, it is a good sign that the company did not issue new shares and dilute the shareholders. So for it to buy back their shares is a very good thing for the remaining shareholders because their equity in the company and the earning per share decreased by 1.7%. Caterpillar Inc. operates through four segments and they are construction industries, resource industries, energy and transportation, and finally, financial products. To be honest, I realize it is not possible to list all their products in this video because each product portfolio has many products. So I'm just showing some of the new products that they are advertising on the company website. Something that caught my eye in the annual report is the number of the full-time employees in 2021. Compared with 2020, their workforce increased by 10.6%, which means there is a growth in the demand for their products, which is a good sign. But I wondered if that growth is more or equal to the pre-pandemic level, so I found the same information in the 2019 annual report, and as you can see, when I compare 2019 and 2021, the company has 5.3% more full-time employees. This information encourages me to believe that they are doing well and will pass the pre-pandemic business level if they have not already. One quick note is that the increase of full-time employees is mostly in two regions, the Latin America and the Asia Pacific regions. The accounting department that prepared the annual report provided many details about the revenue, like for example what you have in front of you which is the breakdown of the revenue by geographical region. So now we have a better idea about the revenue growth because we know the company increased its workforce in Latin America and Asia Pacific regions. So it is reasonable to say that the revenue coming from these two regions should grow by at least 10%. Finally, the annual report has a nice graph showing the growth of the stock price from 2016 to 2021 assuming that all the dividends are reinvested. The graph shows a growth of 153% in 5 years, which means about 30% growth per year. But please don't forget that this graph assumes the dividends are reinvested and you held the stock for 5 years. Now let's jump to the valuation part. In this Excel workbook, I only need to input the financial data of the company in the first sheet and it flows to the other sheets that will prepare the intrinsic and the market valuations. So I entered financial data from all three financial statements for the past eight years. And I only used the items that are relevant to the valuation that I'm performing. For example, from the income statement, I'm using revenue, cost of goods sold, operating cost, interest expense, depreciation and amortization, and outstanding shares and we will calculate EBIT and EBITDA. For the balance sheet, I have assets, liabilities, current assets, and current liabilities, 
and calculated the working capital. The working capital is the difference between the current assets and the current liabilities, and it is what's available to the company to conduct its business in the next year. And from the cash flow statement, I have net income, operating cash flow, and capital expenditures, which is how much a company needs to spend on their assets to keep them functional, and calculated free cash flow and free cash flow per share. Free cash flow is the cash provided by operating activities minus the capital expenditures. This number is the actual earnings available at the end of the year and could be distributed to shareholders if the management doesn't want to reinvest it back in the business. Finally, the input sheet contains the desired return on investment that you want. It is something that you decide as an investor. I usually aim for 7%, but I accept 5 or 6% as well. The next sheet contains the stock price history for the past 8 years to find the average stock price for each year, which is going to be very helpful in the market valuation method. The next sheet is where we will do the intrinsic valuation method. Before putting a value on the stock, we need to answer a few questions. These questions will address how well the company is doing in its ordinary business operations and the company's solvency. So I usually check to see if the revenue has been growing for the past three years. And in this case, the answer is no, because in 2019 and 2020, the revenue went down, but we know 2020 was a pandemic year. Then I check if the cost of goods sold and operating costs are stable. What I don't want to see is the cost of goods sold and or the operating costs growing because this means less profit margin. In Caterpillar case, these two expenses are stable and this is what we want to see. The next thing I check is the company's solvency or the danger of defaulting on their loans. We need to know if the company is earning enough to cover the interest expense. So to check that, I use the times interest earned ratio. The times interest ratio simply means how many multiples of the interest expense a company earns. If the ratio is only one time, then the company is barely able to pay the interest expense. But in Caterpillar's situation, it is 21 times in year 2021 so we know they will not default on their loans in the near future. The last thing I want to check before moving on to the balance sheet is the outstanding shares. And we can see that the general trend that is going down because the company is buying back their shares, which is a very good sign. As I said earlier, reducing outstanding shares is a very good thing for the remaining shareholders because the equity per share and the earning per share will increase. Moving on to the balance sheet, I want to check the debt and liabilities level. I don't care about the dollar amount, but I want to know how much are they compared to the assets and are they increasing. To be honest, I don't want to see the liabilities being more than 60% of the assets, but here we have 80%. So that is a little concerning for me because 80% of Caterpillar Inc. funds come from the liabilities that need to be paid and only 20% comes from the shareholders. The debt level is 60% which is also too much for future growth. So far, there are two things that I don't like about the financial statements. First, the revenue is not growing in the past three years and the liabilities and debt levels are too high. But I'm not worried because I know COVID caused the revenue not to grow and the earnings are 21 times more than the interest expense. The last thing we want to know is the working capital to the revenue ratio. It is the key to forecast 2022 revenue. This ratio is basically telling us how many revenue dollars are generated from one working capital dollar. The range for the past 8 years is 3.32 to 7.79, but in the last 2 years is 3.32 and 3.71. I will have more than one forecasting scenario, but I think I will go for 4.07 which is the average for the past 3 years. Moving on to the cash flow statement, I want to see that the cash provided from operations is greater than the net income for the past few years 
because cash provided from operations is the lifeline for the company. And without strong cash flow from regular operations, the company is dead. And the reason I want to see cash provided from operations larger than the net income is that the income statement contains non-cash expenses such as depreciation and amortization. Next, I want to know how much is the free cash flow and its ratio to revenue because we need to use this number in the forecast that we will do in a second. The free cash flow to revenue ratio for the past three years is between 7.9% to 10.1%. I think I will go with 9.7% which is the average for the past two years. Now let's do the fun part which is the forecasting. I have four scenarios depending on the revenue forecast key which is the working capital to revenue ratio. This ratio is between 3.32 to 5.18 in the past three years. The first scenario is the worst case scenario. The second is the median case scenario. And the third is the most optimistic case scenario. And the last one, I'm using the average forecast key for the past three years. So using the revenue forecast, we have four forecasted revenues. Then we have to forecast the outstanding shares. We know that the general trend that the company is buying back its shares, and I think it will continue to do so. So to be conservative, I will assume that the management will only buy back 1% of the outstanding shares. And if we do the math, the 530 million shares are 99% of the 2021 outstanding shares. Next, we need to decide how much the free cash flow will be based on the forecasted revenue. We will use 9.7% for all scenarios. The 9.7% is the average for the last two years. This will give us $5.3 billion for the fourth case scenario or $10.13 per share. The $10.13 free cash flow per share is what the company will make after one year, so we need to discount it to convert it to the present value. So I discounted that number by 5% according to the present value of the annuity table, which will bring it down to $9.62. This number is the forecasted discounted free cash flow per share. And if your required return on investment is 5%, then the highest amount you should pay for the stock is $192, which is the intrinsic value of Caterpillar stock. If you want a higher return on your investment like 6%, then the intrinsic value of the stock is $160. Please join me in the next video where I will do the market valuation method for this company. Thank you for watching this video to the end and please don't forget to subscribe and like this